I don't know when it was the first time that I had communion, but I was fairly young. I remember the importance of it, though I don't remember the exact teachings I was taught at the time, but what I do remember growing up in the Episcopal Church was reading from the common book of prayer every week. See, communion was the centerpiece of the service every week, and you read the same thing kind of over and over and over again each week. I'm not knocking it. I, I, I you know, was in that faith. It did great things for me for a long time, but it's a very different approach. But one of the things that really struck me early on was the words that we had to read before coming forward that said, we are unworthy to come to the table. We are unworthy to come to this table to you. And that always struck me as off. That always struck me as wrong. And at the time, I was like, okay, I must just need to learn something new that I don't know since I'm younger and clearly hundreds of you know, wonderful religious leaders have put these books together for hundreds of years, and so this must be right, and it just made me feel yucky. Then, shortly after I was confirmed in the Episcopal Church, I was invited by a friend to go to his Catholic church, and we went there, and as part of a service, it was kind of a celebration, it was a youth thing, and we got together, and we were there, and then there was a service during this gathering that we had, and we came forward, and they invited us forward for communion, and I went up to get communion, and they said, are you Catholic? And I said, no, and they said, you can't have it. And I felt small. And I felt that unworthiness. And I felt excluded and outside and rejected in a church, in God's house. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever felt that rejection? Have you ever felt a form of religion where that form of religion has made you feel less than instead of lifting you up, has tried to push you down instead of lifting, bringing a hand down to lift you up? I have. I have. I am not welcome to get communion next door. And neither are any of you. A rejection of the teachings of Jesus. A rejection of the teachings of Jesus. But let's not just take my word for that. See, I am here to facilitate a path of yours to learn to get closer to God. I am not an intermediary between you and God. But so many forms of this faith have made it that they're intermediaries between you and God, and that is not biblical. It is not biblical. But don't take my word for it. Let's dig into here and see what the Spirit of Jesus is in these situations. And so we turn to the gospel according to Matthew chapter 9. So we're about a third of the way into the gospel according to Matthew. And just before the passage that David read, Jesus has healed someone who is paralyzed. He has helped someone with mental illness and demons and that kind of thing. And so he has really grown in terms of his reputation and people are getting to really know him quite well. And as Jesus was walking along on this day, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. Now we hear some of these different stories of the callings of disciples where Jesus just kind of goes up to somebody, says, follow me, and they get up and drop whatever they're doing and leave. Does that strike anybody as a little strange sometimes? Right? So there are reasons for why this happens, and I will go through them over time, not now, with the different disciples and why each of the disciples would have left in that moment and why that makes sense. But I'm going to describe about Matthew now and why this made sense. Matthew was a tax collector. A tax collector was not like our current IRS, right? This is not what we're talking about. The tax collectors there was, were the most despised people in all of Judaism the most despised people in all of Judaism because their job was to collect 
money for Rome from poor Jewish citizens. And then to enforce that along with Roman soldiers, including taking possession of their assets, including taking possession of people in their family if they had to. These were the ultimate traitors to the Jewish people. And they made good money, and they were protected by the Roman Empire. But these people were shunned, rejected, not welcome at the temple, not welcome in religious services, not welcome in their society because of that status. And so they would have been alone and shunned and despised and hated by everybody around them. And not even liked by the Romans who they worked with. They were just kind of tools being used by the institution of that time. And one of the greatest things at this time that you could be was a disciple of a prominent religious teacher. It was to be the disciple of a prominent rabbi of the time, of which by now Jesus had really ascended to that kind of stature. So he was going from being despised and having this weight on him, from being alone and rejected, to all of a sudden being offered the opportunity to follow one of the most prominent, one of the most, like, top ten, right? He was rising in the charts at this point. People that you could follow, and all of a sudden he's like, I can leave this and then be back in community and accepted with a respected leader. This is who Jesus is. Going to the ones who are despised the most and welcoming them in to come along, to lift them up. Then the passage jumps forward to dinner time. And it says, as Jesus sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners... They say tax collectors first because it's worse than sinners. Like, that's the worst. And then we go to the sinners sitting with him. And people asked, the Pharisees asked, asked the following. See, the people are there, and Jesus has introduced and brought all of these people around a table to gather together. Welcoming an individual who's rejected, welcoming a group of different people. And this would involve, as it said, multiple tax collectors. It would have involved prostitutes. It would have involved men. It would have involved women. It would have involved all kinds of different people, whether it was around this particular table or on different days or different weeks. He did this all the time. And the Pharisees who, who believed that you were supposed to be purified before you could sit down to a dinner with the religious leader are like... What are you doing? Right? They're enraged. They're enraged. They're like, what are you doing? You are not supposed to be with these people. You are not supposed to be with these people. These people are supposed to repent and come and bring a sacrifice and do all of these things before they can be around your teacher, before they can be around Jesus. And Jesus responds, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. That's his response to their yelling at him, what are you doing? He's like, I'm doing something new. And why would Jesus feel that he needed to do something new? Because back then, when people were hurting and wanted to get to God, the way they did that primarily was if you were in the Jerusalem area or anywhere around that area, was to go to the temple. And what was believed is that God's special presence, not all of God, God was known to be everywhere, but a very special concentration of God's presence was right in this temple. And so you had to go to it in order to be made good in your relationship with God once you had been separated from God in whatever behaviors or lack of behaviors that you had done. And it's the, the religious leaders' policy was, you can't just walk up there yourself. The religious leaders would say, you have to go through us. You have to go through us. And that almost always involved someone needing to do a sacrifice or donate money in order to be able to be blessed by the religious leaders, the temple priests and the others, to be able to get to God, to the temple, to be able to be good with God again. 
And when you weren't good with God, a lot of times that meant you couldn't even interact with other people in your society until this was fixed. A lot of pressure here. So you're like, you have to go through us. And Jesus is like, no, that's not how it is supposed to be. It's one of the biggest things that got Jesus in trouble. It's one of the biggest things that got Jesus killed. We're saying that this institution of the temple wasn't, wasn't operating the way it was supposed to be done. And lots of prophets before that had said the same thing. And Jesus is like, this isn't the way it is supposed to be. So Jesus provided an alternative. And he provided the bread and the wine. The bread and the vine and said, this is how you can do this. Instead of going and killing a goat or killing a lamb or giving tons and tons of money, when you are with me or when you are at home, all you have to do is have some bread and have something to drink, and you can come and come directly to me or directly to God. You don't need an intermediary in a religious leader to do that. He was trying to destroy this idea that there's something that can separate us from our direct relationship with God. So everything turned out exactly right from there, right? Right? Everything turned out exactly like Jesus wanted at that point? See, this is the great irony of so many forms of the faith today. Is that there are so many people who are trying to get to God, trying to get to the living Jesus, trying to get into right relationship, trying to make that turn and to do good things. And the religious leaders saying, stop. And what do they say? You have to go through us. The exact same thing that was being said 2,000 years ago that Jesus was saying, I stand against everything you stand for in doing that. And so a lot of forms of church have reestablished the very thing that Jesus fought against. That there is somehow a barrier between the people who want to get to God and the people and to, God, and to God's self. Right? That there has to be an intermediary that somehow, and the intermediaries say that before you can come to this table, the table of grace, the table to get the bread and the vine, the thing that Jesus used to say there's no longer this separation was now being used that in order to be able to come to the table of grace, first you had to come to the priests to be able to, to, to be told, oh, okay, now you're perfect and worthy to come forward. But perfection has never been the God standard. Perfection has never been the Jesus standard. That is a human standard placed on other people in order to maintain control of folks trying to get to God. See, God never had perfection as a target. It said here, after God had created this amazing, awesome world with majestic mountains and seas and people and plants and animals, God saw everything that God had made and indeed God called it very good, but God did not call it what? Perfect. God's own creation before we could mess it up. And we've done a pretty good job of that. Right? Which is why we need to do some things to fix this world. But before we messed it up, God didn't even call God's own creation perfect. But yet, there are people saying, you have to do things exactly this way, and we're going to say exactly how you have to do it. And they're saying, you have to come through us instead of them being facilitators of getting people to God, which is who Jesus was. Jesus was someone who wanted to raise people up and help facilitate their ability to get to God, not put up barriers against it. And so Jesus is looking at all of this with people saying, stop, with people being made small, with people saying, you're out, you can't be part of this. If you're not part of our version of this, then you're going to hell. And if you're not part of this, you can't be this, and you're shunned, and you're out, and all those kind of things. And Jesus is like, what are you doing? Why have you recreated that which I laid my life down 
to destroy so that you could come directly to God. Perfection is not required to approach God. Perfection is not required. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. Imperfection and the recognition of our imperfection is required, is necessary for us to be able to approach God with humility, with faith, with saying, we know we can't do this on our own. I can't do this on my own. You can't do this on your own. That we need you, God, that we come with a heart of faith, a heart of knowing that we need help, a heart of saying, we want to walk with you, and yes, we repent for what we did, but we're not feeling unworthy. We're feeling that we know we have worth given to, to us by God as children of God, that inherent worth, but the humility to say we know we can't do this on our own. You don't need to have anybody be your interface between you and God. I am not that. I am here to help facilitate that in any way possible. But I am not better than you. And I am not someone through whom you need to go in order to have your relationship with God. And there is nobody who has that authority. And there is nobody who has ever in the history of the world been given that power to be the intermediary between you and God. You can have that relationship all on your own. Now, is that path going to be easier? Is that path going to be better if you find a good place to facilitate that and help you on that path? Yes. Is it going to be better for you if you join a community of faith that shares some of your values, can help guide you and support you in times of tremendous difficulty and join with you in your joy in times of joy? Absolutely. But there's no one in the history of the world who's ever been granted by God the authority to be an intermediary between you and God. And we in addition to be given so great a gift is to be able to have that relationship. We are then called to go find the Matthews, to go find those people who are on the fringes of society, whom people, if they walked in here and saw those people on the fringes of society, might say, you know what, I don't want to come here if they're here. That's who we want more of. Not to grow the church, not for us, but to help the people on the fringes who are hurting. And to make sure that people know that they are invited around this table, that they are invited in this community, that you are welcome, that no matter who you are, you are welcome to this table, no matter what you've done, no matter what has happened, no matter what. Not because I say so, not because that's what we repeat each week, not because that's what Bloomfield Congregational Church has decided, but because that is what Jesus taught. That is what Jesus acted out in Jesus' life. That is what Jesus risked his life for. To make sure you would never have to have someone telling you what to do in order to make sure that you had the opportunity to go right up to God and say, God, I need your help. so we no longer have those burdens, so we can be empowered to go out to those Matthews and invite them in and to surround around a table of grace. Because imperfection is human. Imperfection is never required. But action to help the Matthews and to invite people around the table is. Amen.